Welcome back to Oxford News Now. Now joining me in the studio is Ed Templer, a video journalist here at That's TV, and he's telling us what the papers say. So far we've talked about a few of the Guardian papers, but we've got a few more to get through. So, Ed. Hello, Alex. Let's talk about the Abingdon edition of the Oxfordshire Guardian. Let's, absolutely. So you've chosen a story here that says college takes charge of adult learning services. Absolutely. So Oxfordshire County Council is transferring its adult learning services from the uh, well, it's transferring it to the Abingdon and Whitney Colleges from next Monday. And this is to ensure that it keeps running for as long as it can to the best that it can which I think is absolutely brilliant, and that's all that you really need. Um, evening classes, apprenticeships, and workplace training and leisure courses will be provided by the college from June the 1st. 180 members of the staff currently uh, employed by the County Council will all be transferred to the college with no redundancies or job losses to be expected. Oh my, which is great. well that is great, but I mean, as we know, because we're here also at one of the campuses, it's how can it be so big? Because at the moment they already do Tuesdays and Thursdays for adult learning. And I know that we're having a lot of building work that's happening, but obviously they need to step that up quickly. You'd imagine so, wouldn't you? <laughs> to accommodate that amount of people it does yeah. seem staggering. But apparently they're very happy to be able to transfer them. So, you know, maybe the size of it isn't really that much of an issue, which is quite good. And it's reassuring. Yeah, definitely. I... <laughs> otherwise it would be a little bit unwieldy to accommodate that many people. I wonder if they're just going to be based in Abingdon or if they're going to come across both um by well, the campuses. sounds of it, it seems like it's just going to be across Abingdon. It I don't think it specifies whether it's just Abingdon or Whitney. It just seems to say the Abingdon one. And considering it's in the Abingdon uh, bit of the Guardian, I'm going to hope it's just the Abingdon. <laughs> well, otherwise our car park's going to be pretty full. Exactly. Um, so let's move on to Wallingford. Um, this is actually quite a nice story. It's children taking part in the uh, WW2 D-Day celebrations. They are, yes. 160 school children relived history as they paid tribute to the evacuees of the Second World War, and then they also paid tribute to VE Day, which is great. So a lot of parents, you know, parents waved their children off as they would have done back in the day, seeing them go off on a little train and stuff. So it's really exciting because actually it's kind of, you really get to go back to what it would have been like. We've all seen the railway children and films like that, where you see them kind of waving them off. We've even seen Harry Potter. It's a similar kind of scene, just without the wizardry and stuff like that. I haven't seen Harry Potter, but I, is, it, is it actually relevant to the World Wars? No, but it's got the same waving the children off from the trains thing oh, and that's what that's what I was going for tenuous. rather than the yeah that was massively tenuous but that's what I was going for rather than the wizardry side of World War Two. Um, it seems to be from a Charles Lee Primary School's head teacher, um, she said that the event was really emotional. Having all the parents waving them off was just quite overwhelming. One parent actually stood alone in a field waving to the kids with a handkerchief, which made it that much more special. Oh, wow, that would be quite impressive to see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Charles Lee Primary School is quite close to uh, a huge field, actually, so I can imagine... That must imagine have been where they were. The people driving past across the bridge must have thought that. It was an awfully strange uh, experience to see in the morning. <laughs> What's more harrowing is that... Well, not harrowing, but the children, which were all aged 7 to 11, um, they were given, they had to make their own gas masks for the trip. So they really were pretending to be refugees and stuff, which I, like, it's, I would have loved to have done this if I was that age. It would have been really incredible to see exactly what kind of some of our grandparents and great-grandparents actually went through, whether they were waving their kids off or whether they were the kids that were being waved off. It's just very, it's quite moving. I think it's a really touching way of um, honouring that mm. and quite vivid, actually, to bring it to the imagination because we've all seen the kind of jittery black and white footage or we've all you know we can all imagine it but seeing it like this really really nice apparently um they performed vera lynn's wartime classic we'll meet again oh how lovely when I mean, there's been so many things that are going around our county actually for the celebrations itself um we also had on the weekend the riflemen that went through the town the first time they had freedom to the city wow. we've also had other at abingdon air show we had um some old fighter planes going up. So a lot of things actually, people are really supportive of what happened in the past, as, as negative as it was. You know, it's good old like British mentality, isn't it really, to make sure that we're, we're remembering and keeping those things alive. It's true. I'm, it also makes me wonder what events that are currently happening, you know, any tragic events that happen in our lifetimes, which one of these will make it all the way through to you know, 40, 50 years down the line, will we still be on, will we honour them with the same respect and, you know, in the same traditional way that we honour this? I mean, this is from so long ago, you know, 70 years down the line, we get all these school children pretending to be refugees. What kind of things will we be doing in the future with I don't know if we, hopefully, I mean, 
we don't have anything as serious as that. I mean, that was obviously a world war. You can't really compare anything else at the moment. I mean, we've also had huge issues with Katrina, Nepal, um, Sri Lanka, all those issues. But there's not something that we can stand up and be proud of because there's some kind of pride in the wars that's true it was people who gave their lives in order to defend our country and so honoring that is you're right something special we've we've had wars well not in on quite on the same scale but we have had some you know battles and stuff in other countries whether it's in the middle east or whatever so it'd be interesting to see if we honor them in the same way i'm not 100 sure if people are so proud of what happened what is still happening over in those places Yeah, that's true. I think any time will tell. And I do hope that, you know, it was great to have the camaraderie of the many allies that we stood next to. But I personally don't really want to see that happening again. No. <laughs> no. Very well. But something that's going to happen again in the future. So um, did you come back with any more insights into what else is going on? I have. So... I found that um, hashtag, I'm fairly sure I had this being mentioned earlier, but hashtag is the children's word of the year which is interesting. Um, Hashtag has been declared Children's Word of the Year by the Oxford University Press. The uh, press analysed more than 120,000 short stories by children aged between 5 and 13 submitted to the BBC's 500 Words competition. And according to them, uh, new technology is increasingly at the centre of children's lives and the way they are writing is drastically changing. The words that keep coming up a lot seem to include things like email, mobile, and Facebook, Twitter, these kind of things. And they've all been replaced by the likes of Instagram and Snapchat and the word emoji. Uh, All these kind of things seem to be happening quite a lot. And apparently, girls are still writing about fairy tales and princess charming and unicorns, royalty, family, and shopping. Boys are still writing about dinosaurs, superheroes, football, and science fiction. So Hmm. not much has changed, it's good to know, but (laughs) children have extended the use of hashtags from a simple prefix or as a search term to Twitter as an editorial advice, well, device, sorry, to add drama or to make a comment. Well, I do actually, I have noticed that some people, like, you will have a conversation and they'll end it with a hashtag. Hashtag like, jokes yeah, or something, something like that. Yeah, something like that. And you're like, oh, okay, great. I, I'm, I'm in an interesting boat with the hashtag because I think it's too self-indulgent. You see someone post a photo with 80 different hashtags, you go, get over yourself. But, but then I think also that is because, I mean, I'm actually one of those people on Instagram that does hashtag I'm sorry anything to have insulted you. No, you're not having at all. Because it actually gets it my, like, search out there. So I want people to see my amazing pictures. Well, for that, I understand. When you're wanting to tag it as something so that people will actually discover it, that's fine. But that's not what people seem to use it for anymore. No, that's That's, true. that's what it was devised for initially, yeah. and I, I thought that was great. But the way it's used now, like they said, it uses some kind of dramatic device. Well, or the fact someone puts a whole sentence in a hashtag, so you just like, have to break apart. Yeah, like, you have I to try and see where that. the words yes. end. Yeah, no, actually, do you know what? Talking about um, the way that the world is changing, and this is horrific, there is actually, um, you can go out there and buy Shakespeare stories via emoticons and hashtags and all that stuff, and it's uh, ridiculous. So it's tra- kind of translated into Twitter century yeah more kind of 2015 language yes really so there is actually the, yeah, these books um, which have actually pictures of like winky faces and I don't know what the emoticons are officially called but so for example there's a Romeo and Juliet and uh, Romeo spies Juliet and he gives her a wink and then she sends him a love heart back and it's just it's that's taking it a step too far because we're not actually teaching children now to improve themselves we are saying actually it's acceptable Mm. behave and talk like this. What's interesting is that they, they said that this was all done for their 500, the BBC's 500 words competition. And what I'd like to know was, were these typed or were these written? Because I don't know about you, but I never write things down anymore. Everything I, if I have to make notes, I type them. They're, they're done on my phone or they're done on a tablet or they're done on a computer. I, I don't seem to find myself writing things anymore. Mainly because my handwriting is awful. <laughs> but it's, I think maybe that's probably something that we're going to see definitely over the next few mm. years is possibly the kind of prominence of handwriting going ever down. Because yeah. I remember when I was at school, they had smart boards and stuff, and I remember that being this amazing technology where suddenly you could write on the board, but it was on the computer. Mm. And that was, you know, was <laughs> mind-blowing at the time. But now, people you know, people have their tablets, they have their phones. Most kids have a, some kind of smart device, which is weird. But then, if you've got a laptop and stuff, surely it's going to be quicker and easier and more legible to write and do it like that. Well, I think it's, in a way, it's such a shame because I have to say that my spelling occasionally goes downhill because I'm so used to having an auto-check. And uh, I can only imagine that the new breed of children 
I probably wouldn't even learn the basics anymore. No, that's very true. The only other story that I've managed to find is um, that motorists, they've, they've found a compiled list of all the black spots in Oxford oh, right. for uh, traffic. So obviously, literally when we were having our chat earlier, we were chatting about how the A40 was bad and how uh, new housing developments would probably affect that in quite a negative way. But um, figures for 2014 show that there were more vehicles than ever before traveling into Oxford and were taking longer than ever to complete their journeys. Between October and December, the average journey time for one mile on Botley Road in the morning was 14 minutes. Wow. 14 minutes and, and a half, really. Beaumont Street and Hythe Bridge Street weren't too much better with motorists uh, scoring an average 13 minutes to complete a mile between 7.30 and 9.30 a.m. So that's, but that's during the rush hour morning period, mm. which you'd expect. Whereas the A40 leading from Oxford to where oh, we are Swindon, in Whitney, think, doesn't it, go? it it's constantly mm. chocker, and I don't know why. And there were some roadworks going on on one of the roundabouts fairly recently, which I think did was a massive contributing factor to why it was so bad. But it seems to be getting better, but it's well, it's half term bad. though, so sometimes yeah, you're right. that's the reason why. But it was the Wilfercott uh, roundabout that you're you're talking about, yes. And uh, those roadworks were only temporary measure, uh, but as you rightly say, it's something that a lot of people have had issues with. I mean, that was one of the also another big thing in the election debate that every single councillor who was trying to buy for the seat said that they were going to change to A40. I'm not quite sure what can be done unless you I don't know take some more land and make it all dual carriageway. But That's probably the only way you can do that, which obviously people don't want to do. People in Oxfordshire are very keen on their greenbelt status, while some people want to build houses on them, which is understandable. A lot of people want to preserve that natural, beautiful countryside scenery, and the more we try and do that, the more we can really preserve what Oxfordshire is, because otherwise you really have this kind of industrial greyness that's just mm -hmm. going to kind of ever spread out from London into all the kind of beautiful countryside things. So I think it's... You know, we need to find some way of doing it that doesn't involve that. But it sounds like that's going to be the only way you could improve it was to make it a dual carriageway. It'll be interesting to see what they come out with and now that uh, the new person is on the seat. But thanks so much again for telling us what the papers say. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again next week. Absolutely. Thank you very much.